Hey, hey, happy Halloween, guys and ghouls. It's time for a very special holiday-themed episode of the pod. We decided to cover Stephen King and George A. Romero's Creep Show, and I should have learned my lesson by now after doing so many double feature episodes, but I'm really trying to get this podcast down to a more reasonable time of about an hour or an hour and 20 minutes max per episode, but doing an anthology horror movie of five different stories, especially one with as much history behind it and as many angles to cover as creep show was just kind of going to be a non-starter so this halloween special is going to be coming in two parts the first half will be free and available to all listeners and the second half will be a patron exclusive so without further ado let's start the show uh people like to be scared I, as far as being uh defensive i think the first thing that you have to get over is that uh that immediate reaction, uh, well, just how weird are you? Mm -hmm. um, are you all right? Can you be taken out in company? Uh, what are you going to do? What have you done? <laughs> sure. That sort of thing. And when you get around that, then I think in most cases, uh, people will accept you as a, a rational man who does uh, sort of an irrational thing. Mm -hmm. In his spare time, uh, I've known George Romero for, what, two and a half years, I guess now, and George really is the nicest fellow that you would ever want to meet. Uh, mm -hmm. He's he's big-hearted, warm, kind, uh, all of that stuff. <laughs> I get paid for this. <laughs> but, you know, you put on that face and you're going after people. Mm -hmm. We we talked about Creepshow, the, this project that we're involved in, and this is not a plug or anything like that. The idea is when we talked about it, we talked about a lot of ideas. and. And the idea was just to get people into a movie theater, close the doors, and mm -hmm. see if we couldn't get them to cr actually crawl out with jujubes and popcorn in their hair <laughs> from hiding in the seats. And his eyes lit up, and mine did, and it was like jackpot, because that's what you want to mm -hmm. do. And if you're going to do it, you ought to go do it. Good evening, guys and ghouls, and happy Halloween. Welcome to Monster Craze Memoirs, a generational podcast about B-movies. I'm your host, Ian Garcia, and joining me as always is my father, Rocco. Hello. So it's been a full year since we began this podcast with our uh, inaugural episode on From Hell It Came and The Disembodied. And so we're coming back this Halloween to do something a little similar to our Fright Night episode in which we address a movie where it's not from the era that we usually cover on this podcast, but it's definitely related in terms of how it speaks to the, the nostalgia and the particular significance of this era of B-horror and science fiction for a certain generation of post-war baby boomers who in the 1980s were sort of coming into age into their into their 30s and their 40s and were starting to make horror movies and I think we're very much starting to make a kind of horror movie that often deliberately harkened back to those formative years but albeit in a way that was a little bit more I think nuanced you know they were definitely I think they did a little better than some of their forefathers in trying to you know put their money on the screen in terms of innovating special effects and in terms of try experimenting with different styles and in terms of of course upping the ante on content so this Halloween, we decided to watch uh, Stephen King and George A. Romero's Creep Show from 1982. Dad, do you remember seeing this in the 1980s, or was this more or less your uh, se uh, first time seeing it? I have seen it before, but it might as well have been my first time to see the movie. But, so, but I want to get more of the background of your stuff first before we start getting into any of the uh, stuff that I would like to say about it. Yeah, because, you know, Creepshow is a very particular kind of homage in that it's not so much about the movies of the 1950s, that sort of classical drive-in B era. It has much more to do with the sort of, specifically this part of the ephemera of horror and science fiction, popular horror and science fiction, that being the 
the horror comic book, the dedicated anthology horror comic. You sort of, the way you were kind of familiar with them was through magazines, black and white magazines like Creepy and Eerie, which were titles by Warren Publishing in the mid to late 60s. Like, when did you start reading horror comics? Like, when did you start getting into those? Wow. Uh, I'd say sixth, seventh grade. I used to go with my father at the um, local... um, store where he worked he worked at he moonlighted at one of the drug stores and on the opposite side of the drug store was a, a convenience store and there they had a whole rack of magazines and i was able to i don't think i, don't think I ever bought one i mm. mean we, i just sat there and read and they let me they let me read them they didn't mind that i read as long as if you know i bought a bottle of soda pop or whatever whatever they had available but i've read them from cover to cover um those magazines, Monster Magazine, Creepy, Eerie. Yeah, of course, Warren Publishing also published a Famous Monsters, famous of, monsters Filmland, of Filmland, the, the right. great, uh, one of the first in these sort of fan magazines d- dedicated totally to classic horror and science fiction. And they also published these black and white magazines of uh, horror comic strips and anthology horror stories Each one would be in the, they were kind of sister publications, eerie and creepy. One would be hosted, I believe, uh, it was, uh, Cousin Cousin Creepy and Uncle Eerie would be the respective hosts, as it were, of the comic strip. They would introduce all the stories, typically through a lot of really bad, uh, puns. Right. Based on horrible puns. Yeah, terrible puns. Absolutely terrible. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that was in the mid 60s and the interesting thing is that you know with uh Warren publishing you know the way they you know during that period there was still a uh what what was in place during that period and wouldn't really start to be wouldn't become more lenient until about 1970 1972 is what's known as the Comics Code Authority Now, the Comics Code Authority, way back in 1954, had all but virtually banned horror comic books. Uh, There was a a very specific golden age of horror comics, because what you saw in 1950 was that there's this explosion of horror comics, more or less pioneered by uh, William Gaines's EC Comics, where they sort of realized that there was a big market not only among uh, young adults, adolescent males, but also among returning uh, GIs and uh, veterans of the Second World War. There was a big market among them for comic books that were not of the sort of caped crusader and uh, sort of dewy uh, superhero and detective fiction that sort of... or either the romance or the fuzzy animal comedies that were dominating the comic section, that these were audiences that were really into violence, especially graphic violence and titillating sexuality. And so what EC Comics does under William Gaines is they start testing the waters in the late 40s, and then in 1950, they introduce these three anthology horror, dedicated horror comics, which were really the first, uh, not so much the first, but like definitely the most prominent and the most significant dedicated ongoing horror comics that were introduced into the American marketplace, those being The Vault of Horror, The Haunt of Fear, And, of course, the one that people are probably most familiar with because of the HBO series that was adapted from it, Tales from the Crypt. Now, just like Creepy and Eerie, these were all comics that were very much in the same vein. They had a host, a sort of host who would introduce each of the stories, again, usually laced with a lot of really bad puns. The stories themselves... The Crypt Keeper. Yeah, the Crypt Keeper in the case of Tales from the Crypt. Yes. And all of these stories would, again, they would they would have the formula they would follow is that they would usually be quite graphic. They would be quite uh, extreme for the time in terms of what was available just on your average drugstore comics rack. 
And each one of them would also have a sort of, especially with the host, you would have a, this, there would be this sort of tone of like gallows, sardonic humor. And each one of the stories, virtually all the time, there would be some sort of twist ending or something, some, uh, uh, Twist yes, of po- twist ending. Yep, of That's poetic exactly justice. Yeah. Right, and so in 1950, those comics are introduced. They're incredibly popular, and there's an explosion in the industry of imitators. Like the biggest competitor for EC at that time was Atlas Comics, uh, which would go on to later become Marvel Comics. Although they would become much better known for their superheroes of the late 50s and the early 60s. And, you know, it's it's significant to talk about horror comics because movies during this period were generally extremely, you know, no matter how weird they were, they were generally very, very tame. Like, even in the late 50s and the sort of films that we've covered, like, there's some graphic violence, but in general, there's a lot of sort of gesturing at stuff that the filmmakers themselves can't show either because they're hedging their bets that they're not going to get away with it from the the industry self-regulatory or the regional censors or they just don't have enough money to <laughs> to put that kind of con- a convincing uh, violent effect on the screen the thing about comic books is that your ability to depict the kind of graphic violence that there is a sort of puerile desire to see is only limited by, well, I guess by the amount of money that you have to pay for and the amount of time you have to do some really good art, but really just by your imagination. And so the big draw of comic books like these is that you could really see the sorts of really graphic and detailed depictions of the macabre and of the bloody and of the gory and of the morbid that you just couldn't get anywhere else in popular culture and you know even you know William Gaines and Martin Goodman who ran Atlas Comics you know they would very often put their best illustrators to work on their horror comics not just because they needed people who could give really graphic detail but also because there's frequently a lot more atmosphere and a lot more emphasis on setting in a horror comic to create a good sort of mood that'll get you but of course those very same things put horror comics and a sort of harder mystery and crime fiction sort of tangential to it right in the crosshairs of the federal government and of moral crusaders so what happens in 1953 is you have the senate subcommittee on juvenile delinquency as we discussed in our sort of talk about the teen exploitation movies of the late 50s during the second world war and after there was an absolute explosion in juvenile delinquency and juvenile crime rates in america and one of the most sort of common sort of pop psychological explanations for these phenomenon was obviously that popular culture was in some sense encouraging the kind of moral degeneration of young people. And in particular, um, there's a book that's published in 1954 by, by a uh, psychiatrist named Dr. Frederick Wortham called The Seduction of the Innocent, The Influence of Comic Books on Today's Youth, in which he claimed that the comic book industry promoted sadism and sexual dysfunction among impressionable young people, and, you know, that it also sort of encouraged their antisocial tendencies. Because, of course, these comic, you know, it's like you could have a comic where people are being beheaded, where rotting corpses are rising from graves to get revenge. These are not the comics that you want your parents knowing that you read. So, of course, if you're an adolescent, you're going to, you know, uh, maybe it was different for you in the mid-60s, but, like, these are the sorts of materials that you're going to hide from your parents in order to get away with reading them. But nonetheless, the Senate Senate Subcommittee on uh, Juvenile Delinquency 
there was a lot of emphasis placed on horror comics and of the comic book industry in general, which despite the fact that they ultimately did not conclude that there was a relationship between these comics and juvenile delinquency and juvenile behavior in general, the extent to which this kind of moral this moral panic around horror comics reached the level of this in the United States Senate it really was a very sort of embarrassing moment for the comic book industry and it sort of created a harsh uh, self-regulatory and self-censoring backlash which is not at all that different from what happened in Hollywood during the mid 30s where there where the extent of moral backlash against the content of films similarly produced the implementation of the Hayes production code in the case of the comics code authority which is formed in a uh, September 1954 horror comics themselves are more or less um banned completely they you know Part of the Comics Code Authority was that you could not even use the words horror or terror in the titles of your publications. Uh, you could not use certain monsters. You you couldn't depict vampires or werewolves or zombies. So you were basically they systematically closed off a lot of the content that you could depict in a comic book. Basically, that's the end, is that from the 1950 to 1954 is kind of the golden age of full-color dedicated horror comics. But what you saw in a, what Dad is talking about in the mid to late 60s is a way that publishers like Warren Publishing attempted to get around censorship by using publishing standards to get around it. So rather than publishing in color, he would publish in black and white. Rather than publishing in the standard comic book dimensions, he would publish in standard magazine format of 8.5 by 11. So he could say, this is not a comic book, this is a magazine, therefore it is not subject to your same restrictions. And of course, he would sell it for 35 cents as opposed to the standard 12 cents for a comic book so that he could get around it that way. And so that's how you start to see the sort of return a small return in horror comics from a period of deep, deep industry self-regulation and censorship. And it more or less is sort of the same to the modern day where there are very few mainstream major dedicated horror publications. The vast majority of horror comic work is done through independent companies, you know, smaller startups and even sort of self-published works. And that's sort of the case well into the 1980s when Creepshow is made. So let's talk about the opening of Creepshow. Well, I wanted to, oh, mention, okay, yeah, wanted to mention, though, and I think maybe you can comment on this, is when I, even when I was a young kid, there was an appreciation for, I when I used to read them, I said, these are, these are damn good. I mean, and what were these people paid? You know, to do all this art. Oh, in the early comics industry, yeah. virtually nothing. And to write the stories, and yeah, actually, no. and they're, and they're yeah, good. no, you didn't get that either. Yeah, you're. They're a good story. I said, man, I even when I was just, well younger, I said, this is ridiculous. These are really good, and they were very good. They were good. They're good stories. Not all, not all of them were hits, but many of them were very. I said, wow, that's a great idea, and it's going to die here. Where, where did all the ta- where did all that talent go? I mean, some of these, th- those stories must have died. Can you find Eerie or is it available? I mean, you can still find republications today. And, you know, e- you know, it's like, and that's the thing is that like, you know, these things survive. I and think I think you gave me something for. A yeah, I, at, at a dime, I think at a, like a dime bookstore, I found a copy. Compilation, right? A, yeah, a compilation of creepy uh, comic book stories, like in a very compact, like, I think like it must have been just like a six by a. Yeah. By three uh, little collection. Mm -hmm. But yeah, these, you know, but like, you know, with the decades, there's definitely been a lot of work to restore and recover and republish a lot of these comics in new collections. And obviously there's not the same moratorium on them as there once was. But mostly what I'm what I'm getting at here is that there's this there's this precedent with horror comics. There was this very distinct period where their star rose very quickly, but then got shut down 
almost as quickly, like within the span of just four years. There's this boom, and then the bust comes. And the bust doesn't come because they're not popular. The bust comes because they absolutely are popular, because kids are reading them, and a lot of very uptight adults are looking at these pages of, like, women with their heads cut off and axes, like, you know, covered in blood, and they're saying, I do not want my child reading this. What is going on in in the opening of Creepshow? Describe to me the scenario that, really good. S- that King uses to open the film. But he uses a kid reading comics whose father disagrees, arguing mm. with a complacent or a, certainly a, a, a... Well, mother's like a zero figure. She's just yeah. basically something you could bounce off of. And uh, the father um, talking about, I don't want my kid reading this shit. Oh, yeah. I can't say it on there. But you know what I'm talking you about. You can you have say to whatever dub. you want. The kid is, by the way, I think it was played by Stephen King's son. Yes, Joe Hill plays the little boy in the prologue and epilogue of Creepshow, a young man who, the only thing we really know about him is that he really likes everything horror. He's got a Dracula poster right, right above his bed. He's got right. a mobiles right. of right. bats that and spiders. That I didn't spiders. have. I didn't have that, that kind of stuff. But It's I, clearly supposed to take place on around halloween because there's a right. jack-o'-lantern in the window there's a lot of emphasis placed on the horror stuff right. and his father has discovered a horror comic book and throws it in the trash but not before slapping his kid in the face after he challenges him because it's like you were you, you i don't understand why i can't read my horror comics but you get to keep your sex magazines and, and your, your underwear, underwear drawer, drawer. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love that for yeah her. he gets belted pretty hard for that uh, the, yeah, the, you know, Billy is the name of this little kid. And like, let's see, what's the name of Billy's father again? Fuck, the actor who plays oh, him. Cause um, he's very good. I've seen him before. No, he's, he's, play, some... he's a bit part player and he's very good. Yes, you're right. He plays, he plays in several, his name is Tom Atkins. Oh yeah. He he's pl- a good guy. He good plays actor. St- Stan, he plays Stan in the movie. That's the opener. And you can sort of, again, you can see, like, I don't even know if it was intentional, but you can see the sort of thread that organically leads from the censorship of horror comics to this movie, which is an homage to horror comics, which then uses that as like an opening premise to this big anthology story where, of course, we are going through the uh, the comic book that was thrown in the trash and all of the five stories that make up its body. And you definitely... Really great. Yeah. I think it's a great movie. Yep. Yeah, so like there's five segments in the film. It opens with one called Father's Day about a uh, a sort of family reunion to commemorate the death of this rich patriarch who was a apparently a supreme bastard and who was murdered by his daughter, but who comes back from the dead in order to wreak revenge and to get his cake. Uh, it's followed by by uh, Weeds. Uh, it's not called Weeds. It's an adaptation of Stephen King's short story, Weeds. And the story is in the film is called The Lonesome Death of Geordie Verrill, where King himself plays the titular Geordie Verrill, a bumpkin farmer who, a, a meteorite, lands in his backyard and seeps out a goo that slowly starts to cover him in, in a in a parasitic uh, assimilating plant and then spread out from there. That's then followed by something to tide you over, another fantastic sort of revenge from beyond avenging dead story in which none other than Liam Neeson uh, yeah, Liam Neeson. Uh, Leslie Nielsen. Right. Sorry, I'm Liam always, Neeson. Mi- I'm always mixing up those guys' names. Yes, Leslie Nielsen, obviously, at that point of airplane fame, so already at the point in his career where he's going to become far more known for his comic acting abilities, but which in this one he plays just a, a, a TV producer and a sort of video uh, maven who takes revenge on his wife and her lover and her her lover is played by Ted Danson you know like a really like wonderful cast of like some actually pretty big name stars and some great character actors in this it's then followed by the crate a story of a uh Himalayan or, or like some sort That's of Arctic, never, it, like Bigfoot it's never sort said, of creature, never said, which is a cool. weird monster that is in a crate that's discovered under the staircase of a local university, and then finally finishing off with a 
uh, they're creeping up on you about a rich man, a rich germaphobe who is slowly overcome by an invasion of uh, cockroaches in his high-tech New York City apartment. What I like about Romero is that... Um, yeah, George A. Romero, who wrote, who directed the film, rather. Yeah. The whole thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So he had a command of the actors. The actors, I think, were really good. Yeah, the cast works very well. The in this cast movie. is believable. They're everybody's on to. Everybody seemed to be invested in these these shorts, um, and and that, even Stephen King, who is kind even of Stephen, broad as a performer, works yeah. completely. No, in this I mean movie. The, the the and I really I really have it off to George Romero to really, you know, that they actually would want to participate to that kind of extent and that much uh that much of. Of acting and ho- in hewing to the, you know, their characters, I thought was one of the amazing. Things. I, I couldn't take my eyes off the film. It was just really well done. I think the whole thing is well done. Uh, you, yeah, the first one, like you said, is wasted sort of. It really doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, Father's than... Day is. Yeah, it's kind of it, it's good as a setup for like what you're about to experience. Yeah, it's like because, oh, here's all the things that are going to happen. Yeah, or here's something. yeah, <laughs> like like basically it says here are the contents of this movie. <laughs> a radically overqualified cast because uh, I think uh who plays the uh the main uh the daughter of the rich asshole in um uh one sec in uh, Father's Day. Or is it Vivica Linfers who plays Aunt Bedelia? I'm trying to figure out. Carrie who... Nye was the one who he's, who's narrating about the someone's coming back, the gra- the the woman's coming right, back. Right. Yeah, I'm talking about Vivica Linfers as Aunt Bedelia because she's the one who killed right. her father way back and sort of is coming back to her grave. She gives a great performance. Right. And Elizabeth Regan was the daughter who's married to. The, Elizabeth um, Regan, yeah. Right, who's married to Ed Harris character. Yeah, Ed Harris just Ed Harris. randomly appearing in the <laughs> well, he was not a big star yet. Nope. Uh no. he he had actually made his debut starring role in Romero's previous movie, Night Riders, which is not a horror movie. It's a strange two and a half hour drama about a group of i haven't seen it but it's apparently about like some group of like renaissance medieval fair motorcycle riders like they do jousting but they do it on motorcycles or something i'm not quite sure of the premise but ed harris starred in that and he appears here in a minor role in as hank the uh as as the sort of a uh, husband who he's basically just the insert character that all of the exposition can be explained to so that he can yeah he he, he had a start in these movies um yeah that's the first yeah that, so that's the first element that sort of creep show sets up is the idea of like a very you're going to get good acting out of this yes. movie you're going to you're going to get a nice little not maybe not necessarily star studded but you're going to get some <laughs> very good people who can d- take this really broad and not accidentally broad but deliberately sort of broad and over dramatic screenwriting that Stephen King is doing specifically to emulate the kind of high sensationalism and drama right. of a 1950s right. horror so you're comic looking at book. the cell by cell right almost. exactly yep and the other thing that Stephen K- uh, that uh, George Romero does like he'll do something like like the most obvious will be in so, some transitions during the movie the shot itself will be composed within a comic book panel like in so in the um in Father's Day like the most obvious one is where they're talking about uh Vivica Linfer's character Aunt Bedelia driving there and in the next shot it's the bottom of a comic book page with two panels side by side one panel is the forward facing wide shot of Bedelia's car coming down the road it passes by the camera and then the second right. panel we mm-hmm. see the car in wide from the reverse shot going into the you know, so there's some t- so sometimes that'll happen. Sometimes there'll be like a a little bubble in the corner that will right. say so and so days later. But definitely the and of course there will be certain shots where the lighting will take on a monochromatic or a dichromatic uh, or a bichromatic um, 
mm-hmm. pallor, right. like a cer- just a two, one or two primary colors that will dominate the entire scheme. You know, usually to emphasize something, you know, a certain like moment of really bizarre or uh, or sort of horrific revelation. And then there will also be other just like really weird touches where like the there will be like a a composite effect where a character usually what happens is that it'll be a close up shot of a character uh, either being very scary or screaming. And the background will just be some like abstract art Mm -hmm. that is just sort of impressionistically representing their sort of emotional horror and the sort of brooding of it all so we get all of those things in the opening so that that's more or less what father's day is there that's right it does it does set all those up then they become a little more straightforward well they get fleshed out more right in progressively throughout the film right uh I think, you know, it's like, and I think that's true. I think Father's Day may, it, you know, it's the first story. It's also the least um, compelling, but it does sort of get you in the mood for what you're about to watch. It sort of, it establishes, you know, it establishes the framework of the movie. Like, you know immediately that Creep Show is not going to be a movie that is going to expend a lot of energy on, like, dramatic realism or on... Or on nece- even necessarily on taking it seriously. There's a there's a certain level again very consistent with the comic books that inspired it. There's a degree of removal of sardonic humor. That part of the idea is that we're here to kind of take a kind of perverse pleasure in these kinds of gory and horrific stories like we may be scared but there's always a sort of uh absurdity to it and a sort of a broad self-conscious absurdity i thought i don't know it's a very good point you made mentioned it's almost like it's almost as if the first story i think the way you set it up is very interesting because i never thought of it that way that it's it's either two things either it's um sensory desensitization Let's get this all out of the way because the next stories you're going to hear are more fleshed out. Right. They're going to follow the same rules as these. And so, you, we, yeah. Let's get this out of the way. And then the other thing that you said, um, also all the elements that are going to be involved in these pictures. Right. Um, so what do we see in the first? Well, he t- t- twists another w- woman's head and cracks, right, breaks her neck. Yeah. One guy he lets a stone fall. We're talking on him. about yeah, yeah, we're talking about a, a grandpa uh John Lormer, Nathan somebody. Yeah, he plays Nathan Yeah, John Lormer plays a uh, Nathan Grantham, the, right, uh, the sort of the, rich patriarch, the patriarch who is, right. who is murdered by uh, Aunt Bedelia, who on Father's Day, I forget how many years later it's supposed to be, but he comes back from the dead as this horrible rotting corpse and proceeds to start killing people. It's he kills of, everybody, even the housemaid. Which is kind of yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Is like, and and that's the that's the thing. Like the and that's the thing. The weakness of the story of Father's Day is just kind of it's kind of just a premise. It's, I it's think kind he of sets just a you monster. up. I think well, he yeah, sets I, you up. He sets you up saying, "Well, sh- geez, this is all it's going to be. I might as well get the popcorn." Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, and, I'm, I'm and stu- then you're go ahead. Yeah, I mean Stephen. I I've read it. I've read Stephen King write talk about this. I read a quote from him. There was this book that I read a lot of in preparation for this called the uh, the Zombies That Ate Pittsburgh, which is a uh, a uh, biography written by Paul R. Gagney from 1987. Why on <laughs> on, on George A. Romero and is sort of a critical biography of his filmmaking. And uh, one thing that like Stephen King even says about Father's Day is that like. When, you know, when I was writing that, I kind of just all I really wrote it was with the idea, OK, uh, some uh, s- something has to come out of the ground and start killing people. He d- and he talks about how, like, I've never really written a story that way and I've never written it that way again, really. But it just sort of had to it's come organic out. Almost, right, right, exactly. It, it's the thing that again, it's like that's the and that's the way I look at it is that like, yeah, it's really kind of underwhelming and flawed. But it kind of needs to come out that way because there's just like it, it's sort of I think that there's some truth to what you're saying is that there's sort of maybe an argument that Father's Day needs to be kind of broad and really kind of puerile in a way that the other stories aren't 
So it almost kind of deflates your expectations a bit. It almost kind of le- disarms you to the possibility that actually there's what's about to follow is actually some really good stuff. It also sort of, again, it, it sort of recreates the feeling of reading a horror comic. Like, not all these no, stories are going to be right. good. A right. lot of them really are just going to be right. built around the premise of a corpse comes or out of the ground right. and it starts killing people. Right. Right. You know, but but then you start, but then you get through the other stories and you sort of, sort of, you get into like the sort of weird morality mm-hmm. of these sorts of stories. And sort of what we talked about before with the EC Comics and the William Gain, the uh, William Gaines formula of the, of the poetic justice and the twist ending of the story and how like there's these, you know, and I think uh, there's a quote by Stephen King that I want to read uh, with regards to that quality, E.C. was the last gasp of romanticism in American literature after World War II. In the E.C. stories, you have these horrible people who actually do the nasty. The husband kills his wife or the bad guy kills the saintly second baseman, but they couldn't let it go at that. The scales are all the scales were always put back into balance, even if it meant that this decomposing, rotting corpse had to get out of the ground and go after people who killed him. And so that's the sort of like extreme poetic morality. And he that and it's interesting that King identifies it as a kind of part of like a romanticist tradition. The moral crusaders of the time looked at EC comics and they just saw puerile trash, which is degenerating and bad for the moral development of children. King sees it a completely different way where they're part of a tradition of sort of high romance and high like sort of emotion and morality that you see ex- 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 emblematic in romanticist hmm. literature and which is continued by these stories that quite the contrary of them being decomposing to morality like it might even be the exact opposite problem where these stories have a very harsh like almost puritan puritanist morality at work and i guess we could talk about father's day that way too because again it, that story and the um the lonesome death of jordy verrill they're also sort of, these first two stories, they're also sort of distinct from the rest of the film in that they're very cruel. There's not really a sense of there being a poetic justice that's being done in the story. Because the only impression that we get is that John, John Lormer's character, Nathan, and Grandpa Nathan in the movie, the only real impression that he we get is that he really was just an awful prick and who potentially that's the other thing he potentially murdered Aunt Bedelia's in the exposition dump that we get for uh for the benefit of Ed Harris we we learn that he killed Aunt Bedelia's uh lover and and fiance and so he gets killed but then years later, Aunt Bedelia is now just this broken down cigar smoking alcoholic who is just who comes back on Father's Day every year just to sit in front of the grave and basically just drink herself stupid and mourn how like her life is over and nothing ever got better. What do you think I've got you here for? You're just like all the others. Screwed up my mother, you screwed me up. You got me so mad, drove me crazy. I want my cake, Bedelia! You bitch! You called me a bitch! 
Sylvia fixed it all. Ashtray back in place, chair overturned. Little fool, Daddy, bad fool. Nobody could catch us, nobody. You taught me, you taught Sylvia, they taught us all. And then she gets killed by her father, her asshole father coming back from the dead and and uh, killing her. And then he just kills a bunch of other people who, I guess, like, he talks about it, like, in the flashback scenes. Like, he talks about how, like, everyone is just after my money. Everyone is just after my will. But it's just sort of this weird thing where it's like there's really no good people in this story. There's just sort of some people who are... Uh, more abused than the rest, and like I don't know, I, like did yeah. you get that sense that like there's kind of a difference between Father's Day totally? But it's not an unusual. I'm trying to think of some other movies where you have like revenge stories where someone's killed off, and then the siblings are just as just as bad, yeah, just... or lazy or whatever, or right. just they never made anything of themselves, and there's a lot of self pity. Uh, going on like like they had all the opportunity but they still managed it. and yet they blame other people or they blame yeah they made the patriarch why they turned out the way they did maybe they did maybe there's something to that but like you said there's no real trade-off between the uh, uh revenge or if you will a, a justice at some point or even a, a moral moral uh recognition um in that first one so you're right. So it's all all comes down. And the second one as well. Um, yeah. So talk about. I the, really like yeah, the talk, second yeah, one. Yeah. It, it, I talk, like the second. Take us through the story of the lonesome death of Ter- uh, lonesome death of Jordy. Lonesome death of uh, yeah. Ver- Jordy Verrill. Yeah. Just take us through the whole segment, beat by beat. I thought it was kind of poignant. I, mean, I was looking at it. It was funny, but you know, I'm thinking of. Well, all, take us take us th- through the anyway. So the, he. Yeah, yeah. You know, he's a poor guy, and then there's a meteor that crashes in his, um, in his, on his property, and he goes to it, and there is a meteorite that's very hot. And he's and, very excited. And he goes through all kinds of mach- machinations in his brain about what this could yeah, mean. Yeah, we get these very vivid uh, dreams. Some scenarios. are good, so, some no, are... Yeah, t- <laughs> so, let's go through each one of these as they develop. What is his first uh, daydream? What does he think is going to happen? I forget the first one. first one was he's going to make money off of it? Yeah, he's going to go to the university. Right. University, he's going to sell and, it. And it's all, and and like, I love it because in his daydream, outside of the office that he's going to be selling the... Meteorite study. Yeah, all... Yes, <laughs> Office of Meteor Study. <laughs> right, and he goes in and he thinks he's getting a lot of money for... He, he ends up haggling with the <laughs> professor over the price. The professor only wants to give him $50, but he won't settle for anything less than 200 200 Right, 200 and, he, and it's really funny. The guy has a money box there, and he takes it. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I mean, like, he just, has the, like, he just has petty cash right. that he's going to be paying <laughs> for the rock. So, <laughs> just the discretionary fund. I mean, but, but it shows the brain of the character, right? Right, exactly. It shows yeah. how he's thinking about it, and then. Um, okay, so then what does he do? He pours water on the meteorite because it's too hot, and of course, not being so bright, when you pour water on something that's scalding hot, it cracks. <laughs> right, it cracks right in half. And then what does he think has happened? Well, he thinks that they're, they're not going to give him any money for a broken meteor, right? <laughs> yeah, he has the second dream where he's imagining getting laughed out of the office. Not a dream. Is it a dream or is it? Yeah, it's it... a daydream. Daydream, yeah. right. Yeah. And, and so, so he says, and so he picks it up, of course, and that's where he gets the... But I think what's poignant about it is yeah, that... The, Go ahead. There's this goo that comes right. out of the meteor that and goes. It actually, first it's... goes into the soil, but it also gets on his fingers. Right. And this is where this is where his bad luck really begins because right. he starts first he gets with these weird boils on his fingers, but then they slowly grow into a uh, green sort of fungi. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's really uh, terrible. Growth. And then he, you know, and he has a moment with that. Then it gets to his third dream 
which is daydream which is the best where he considers calling the doctor but then the same character who was playing the college professor in his the university professor in his dream is now playing the doctor but really who, who old is, doctor shaking and probably drunk yeah <laughs> like it's like and he's saying that he needs to amputate his fingers <laughs> and he takes a big butcher well, no, no, no. but he goes into a sterile right. unit and he pulls out a hatchet, like a like a cleaver, <laughs> which is improbable tool yeah. that you use for. But yeah, so it's, funny. it's wonder the yeah, wonderful yeah, cartoon yeah. logic, cartoon of logic. Yeah, like the, yeah. you, and he, you're right. You get this impression, and oh, of course, like the great moment for Stephen King's performance because Jordy just sort of compulsively sucks at his finger, right? Which gives you and a, touches his face, right? Which is, and of course, it gives you a great impression of the kind of naive quality of this character that he's this grown man with his own like like farm like the, just sort of a dirt farming old guy who you know he we, if he was if he had not discovered this meteorite he would just be sitting watching television drinking a beer which is what he does when he realizes that he's been sucking on his fingers this whole time and then he looks in the mirror and looks at his tongue and sees that his tongue is also starting to get the right. green growth that's sort of the story he slowly becomes assimilated by this weed, this weird alien weed, which is also taking over his entire fucking farm, right. which he doesn't realize until too late when he goes outside. What's poignant about it is that I guess because I, I guess because it conjures up other films in, in which a meteorites have hit. Again, very poor people in the backwoods, and I'm wondering if if King Stephen King got his idea from this picture. Yeah, you're right. In the typical in the typical fifties sci fi film at least, These usually they're discovered by dread. a scientist or an educated person. Right, right. This is an interesting sort of twist that he brings up where it's like what if it's just some rube? Like, what if, like, like if the fate of the world rests in the hands of somebody who doesn't even like uh Right. Understand that a a meteor is valuable regardless of whether or not it's broken in half or not. Exactly. It doesn't matter. It's broken. Any case, but you're definitely right. There's like a. It's not a, a bad. Pic, it's not a bad picture. I'm sorry. It's it, like, it, and it's shot in such a way, very like you said, the monochromatic. There, whenever he's in the house, there's got this green light on him. It's, yeah, it's like it's and shiny. then in, like the weird, like the sort of. And it, that's the thing is that like there's this. It's this weird thing where it's like with the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, There's much more pathos to the story and to the character because you're caught in this weird dimension where basically the entire story is just about his completely undeserved suffering right for the kind of ignorance that you could totally expect anybody in his class and in his education level to do but like and you're caught with this realization that part of it is that we're supposed to get some sort of dark macabre enjoyment out of his progr his ignorance and his eventual suffering but you feel this deep sort of connection to him as this as this thoroughly alone figure because right. he's not married he has no kids he doesn't even have a dog or anything no he's nothing just, in the house is him he just sits at home watching tv drinking a beer and now he's being uh, eaten from the inside out by parasitic alien <laughs> plants and he keeps talking about this throughout the story is that like just bad luck it is like and you get this impression that, yeah, he has been served a lot of like, you know, uh, hard hands throughout his life. And I think the part of the story that really makes it for me is the there's this weird uh, moment where he, like the 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 plant has really started to grow over his entire body, like his hands are starting to get completely covered. He's got a big bushy beard of the stuff like he's starting to look like a wolf man of plants. And he the only way he can stop the itching is if he gets into a cold bath because the plants are really itchy. And so he fills a cold tub of uh, cold, a tub of cold water and then his father appears to him in the mirror, like apparently like the plants are affecting his mind and he's having like some sort of weird like mm -hmm. s internal uh, hallucinatory episode. And his father is just telling him that like if you get in that tub, you're going to you're going to be dead. Like, you know, it's like the plant the plant wants you to get in the tub. 
and he just said and he just sort of decides well i'm dead anyway so what's the point and even and then the culmination of the story is he has been completely engulfed from head to toe in the plant and he finds his shotgun and he's basically just begging God that it'll work. And then he just shoots himself in the head. And apparently that does work. And he successfully kills himself. It's just a very, it's very different. Like, and it hits on such a deeply primal level mm-hmm. in a way that the first story does not. No, but well, I the think first that, story was met, like you said, I think it was a setup. Yeah, for, the, like, for us to not really expect that like this, this funny comic book movie is going to actually turn out to be weirdly poignant. Yeah, it is. Like the- I said, it, it just really, I thought it was, I thought it was well done. I thought it was, I mean, you're right. I mean, I, I just, and when you're younger, you just glance over it because it's, there's not enough gore in it. Right? right. So, so, but when you're older and you look at it, you say, this is really an interesting story. I mean, it just, I thought it was interesting. And, and of course, like the twist ending is that like, well, it's not really a twist ending, but you get it great because it ends with the farmer's the, report. The drought has stopped. You're going to have a lot of rain. Your growing season is going to continue. Yeah, well, and, and you get a great signpost, like on the roadway, there's a signpost that shows all the major cities. Yeah. In so, you know, direction. it's somewhere in, in, is it, 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 it must be Maine because it's Portland. So, Either Portland, Maine, or Portland, yeah, Oregon. Yeah, it has to be somewhere or thereabouts. Yeah, because that's where he lives, right? He's up in Maine. Yeah, whatever. It, yeah. It, and that's the great thing about Stephen King and George A. Romero as filmmakers. Like, Stephen King always reps the uh, Maine and New England as sort of his stomping grounds. He's a very much a regional author. And for his own part, George A. Romero has always been a regional filmmaker, too. He's, I believe, like, he's he only filmed in Pittsburgh and the outlying rural areas. He, like, refused basically just on general principle to go to Hollywood because he never wanted to sacrifice his creative freedom. The entirety of Creepshow was more or less shot entirely around a Carnegie Mellon University in uh, Pittsburgh. Mm. Like, more or less the entire film. Even Jordy Verrill's farm is basically just some dilapidated home that was nearby the car that was on the Carnegie Mellon campus mm. that they converted because it would have been closer to film there than to find some outlying farm I didn't know that. property they, they could use. And that's the thing. Like, I think you feel that with the story of the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, where yes, it's making fun of him, but it's you get the sense that King and Romero feel a very deep connection to him on a spiritual mm-hmm. level right. like to a certain extent that to a certain extent that Jordy Verrill is an expression not of like a sort of making fun of the ignorance of like some of rural people but the idea of this character being kind of a projection of our own sort of deep-seated anxieties about like our own ignorance and our own sense of like uh, not having a lot of control and all right, these... not having a lot of control. Right, yeah. that's the yeah, that's the other the other point about that film. There's no con- he has no control over what's happening, and no one else would, regardless yeah. of what their station of life would be. If they did the same thing, they would be growing. Like just yeah. even, and I think it's interesting because there's this one part in that story where he's watching TV, and I don't know what the movie is. But it's a part in the movie where the actress who's playing, like, the mother is, like, doing some, like, one of those sort of parochial, like, pull yourself up by your bootstrap speeches. Like, she's talking about, like, how her generation, we knew the work was hard, we settled the land, and we knew it would be hard work, but we did it anyway. And it's like, and so it's weird because that sort of scene... It, as Jordy Verrill is going out into his yard and realizes that not just himself, but his entire farm is being taken over by the plants, you know, like this voice sort of plays in the background of the scene. And it's almost like it's almost like he talks to it. The dreamers just sit around and moon about how wonderful it would be if only things were different. And the years roll on and they grow old. Oh, oh, oh. And by and by they forget everything, even about their dreams. Oh, I don't want to be like that. I want to be somebody. Oh, everyone laughed at us. They did it all the other pioneers. They said this country would never be anything but a wilderness. We didn't oh. believe that. We were going to make a new country. Besides, we 
wanted to see our dreams come true. Granny, it must have been wonderful. But don't you think for one single minute that it was easy as the project? We burned in summer and we froze in winter. But we kept right on going and we didn't complain because we were doing what we wanted to do. Can you understand that? No. No, 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 no. There's almost like a very understated commentary to the story. Like, you know, George A. Romero, like he he makes very great movies because and he talks about this in the zombies that ate Pittsburgh is that he has a certain level of social commentary and of satire that he puts into a lot of his movies, but he deliberately never gets specific enough so that it overextends itself because ultimately, like, his artist, like, from reading it, his artistic perspective is that, like, Number one, I know that I'm not like an expert on these things. I just know what I observe and what I am capable of criticizing. And I know that there's like this, I mean, you know, it's like so, but like, you know, he has this sort of level of like social commentary to his movies, but it's never obtrusive. It's never overextending itself. And it's always sort of seamlessly integrated into just the drama of the story. And that was the th that was what he was saying is that like you know ultimately he also doesn't have any solutions, and he doesn't really have any solutions. He's a very deeply pessimistic filmmaker, and I think you know like with you know the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, this is like some of the most deeply pessimistic stuff that he's ever done because ultimately you could almost see like the plants themselves as kind of being a metaphor for like the basic nature of Jordy Verrill's life and ever and the lives of everyone like him, how they're just so subject to the sort of right the whim of the right, of, right. the systems of life. Yes. There's no control. Like you just said. Right. Yeah. And like, right. but, you know, so, and there's like all these, and so it's understated, but there's is a sort of class dimension to it. And there's a sort of stark contrast between the way he treats the, he and King treat the rich characters in father's day versus how they treat the subject of Jordy. Verrill. Following the lonesome death of Jordy Verrill, we get right into something to tide you over. Uh, more or less, this is just a star vehicle for uh, Leslie Nielsen. Do you want to talk about like Leslie Nielsen as an actor? Because like I remember, like I remembered growing up with him as the comedy guy. I didn't realize I remembered him from The Naked Gun and from um. Mm -hmm. uh, airplane and uh, mr magoo that awful live action mr magoo wrongfully accused god spy hard i can name all of these movies off the top of my head like he was a big part of my childhood but then sometime later you had you, when i first saw forbidden planet he's completely unrecognizable just because of how much he, differently he aged but he does star in the forbidden planet mm -hmm. as the captain of the spaceship that lands on morbius's planet uh, and he's great in that movie. He's also in the movie The Day of the Animals, which is a kind of apocalyptic movie about a day when animals take over. And he, it's amazing. He can play like a real bastard. Mm. More or less the entire, uh, the entirety of something to tide you over is like this. And again, this is one that also hits really differently because there's, there's not really a lot of comedy in something to tide you over. It really is a kind of almost like torturous mm. story about how he takes revenge on his wife and her lover by basically uh, forcing him to dig himself into a up to his neck on the beach so that he's stuck in the sand. Then he sets up a TV monitor so that he can watch his wife in the same position da somewhere down the beach as the tide is coming in to drown them. And he just drowns both of them, and they ultimately come back as sort of avenging zombies. But you're not sure whether they really are there or if this is just his guilty conscience catching up on him. Yeah, because nothing shows up on the monitors, and so and it looks like it looks like it's his own, which really is kind of strange because you didn't think he had it in him. 
that there'll be any kind of, of subconscious um, morality. Right. I think right. the acting is absolutely superb. I think he plays the most, you know, uh, self-absorbed. You know, you ought to be grateful to us. You know that? I mean, if you ever loved her, you don't now. There won't be any uh, alimony, none of that community property shit. She just wants out. Well, I don't know whether I ever loved her or not, Harry. That doesn't matter. The point is, I keep what is mine. No exception to that rule ever. No exceptions, Harry. Ever. And that sets the tone because there's no, there's no way that you're, you're, you're he's gonna be able to. He's, he's he can't try, be reasoned with. He's no, just you, a totally... you can't buy him out because he's rich. You said, "Well, I have money. I got a lot of." He looks at me, I got money. I can buy you. I own this whole island or a whole area of the beach, and you're going to try to buy me. So it's very, yeah, it's really, really an interesting revenge movie. But I, you know, and it's really, it's well done. I think it's a well done movie. It's sort of the cl closest to that classic EC Comics formula, where, of course, like, and that's really the definitive model. You have a very cruel, kind of torturous body of the story. Then you have the twist ending where the characters come back from the dead as the avenging ghouls. And then the poetic justice where uh, Leslie Nielsen buries himself up to his neck in order to uh, kill himself. And just... Right. Very, 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 very well done, I thought. It's a really, really well done picture. Um, and, but like I said, what I enjoy about it is the fact and all the movies after this point and the near soliloquy by um, um, mm. the last one... Um, wonderful acting is just absolutely superb yeah the last the, 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 the uh, these actors were really into it they were really into this 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 series um but go ahead yeah, talk about the other and, ones. yeah so these last three stories also hit differently because there's much more i mean it sort of returns to the same thing as the uh father's day where it's sort of this much more effete and privileged milieu and sort of the weird kind of just straight kind of psychopathic or <laughs> not psychopathic, but like sexually yeah. dysfunctional and neurotic sort of corruption that sort of pervades anything. So the story that follows uh, something to tide you over is the crate, which is easily oh the, it's the longest segment of the I movie. Just... I think it goes on for like a, a over I think... 30 minutes. It's definitely the longest segment of the but entire movie. His shooting is absolutely yeah. superb. It's and also it's also the um it, it's also the second one which is directly adapted from a story that King previously wrote. Um never mind let's put this last name out of here. That's going to do it for the first half of our Halloween special. If you're not a patron, I highly encourage you to sign up, because as great as the first three stories of Creepshow are, the last two are definitely where you get into the real meat of the movie. It's only a dollar per month to get exclusive access to all bonus content, so please consider subscribing to us on Patreon, not just for this two-part special, but for all of our bonus content, which gets you access to three more episodes a month. With that, I'll sign off to all our regular listeners and ask them to join us next week on Monster Craze Memoirs. <laughs>